House of the Lord this evening. Good to see everyone here. We'll certainly welcome others to join us. And to get us started tonight, I'm going to start off by reading uh, a verse that we can tie in with our Sanctity of Marriage Sunday. In the book of Ephesians, Ephesians chapter 5, Paul writes a lot about the family life and about husbands and wives. Wives, submit themselves yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. Verse 22. Uh, for then in the um, husbands love your wives even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Verse 25. There's a lot of lot to preach on, lots to study on in that passage, a lot that speaks about married life, also about the illustration of Christ and his relationship with the church. But it comes down, there's a summary of it, of uh, practical exhortation in verse 33, the last statement. It says, Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverenced her husband. 
And if we might borrow two, two key things with a healthy marriage, love and reverence, respect. And uh, uh, those are key things that help us to have a, have a good working relationship in marriage, uh, both in their appropriate place and each addressing a particular need in the particular uh, person's life. And may the Lord bless and uh, may we have healthy marriages for the Lord and encourage others to have healthy marriages. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for your guidance. Teach us, we pray. As we open your, the service tonight, we pray that you bless with everyone that is here, and we pray that you bless with others joining us. Lord, that we know there's a number of folks that would normally be in place and not able to be here this evening. Look over their health, their well-being, the projects that they're caught up in working on, different things going on, and help us to, to honor you as a church. And bless with those joining us by live stream online. Lord, we appreciate them and pray for their well-being as well. May you be honored in our service and our gathering together. We gather together in your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, the song we're going to sing tonight, 426, Just a Closer Walk with Thee. Just a Closer Walk with Thee. And uh, it may have been a little while since we sung the song, but I think we can get it out. And it's a beautiful song, certainly expressing our desire to know the Lord, walk closer with Him. Amen. 426. We'll sing all three verses of it. Here we go. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. Just a closer walk with thee. is my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear Lord let it be through this world of toil and snares if I falter Lord who cares who with me my Jesus is my plea, daily walking close to thee, let it be, dear Lord, let it be, when my feeble life is old, time for me will be no more, guide me gently safely o'er to thy kingdom shore to thy shore just a closer walk with thee granted Jesus is my plea daily walking close to thee let it be dear Lord so in our lives you may be seated and uh, may each day may, especially on Sunday may it be a day that we draw near to the Lord uh, we certainly need him uh, but may it not only be on Sunday may it be also Monday and Tuesday Wednesday Thursday Friday Saturday all all through the week that every day is we seek the Lord seek his plan his will in our life and uh, his good good work well let me highlight a few announcements at this time and uh, on a, at the end of the service, we, we will share some prayer requests. Uh, our, of course, our regular prayer night is on Wednesday, but we do have some prayers that we want to be aware of people and their needs, and we want to share that uh, and do a part lifting our brothers and sisters. Lord, tonight we will continue our study and hope it will be a profitable and blessing stu blessed study to everybody, significant historical events of the Bible. 
course, uh, Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we have our come together as we continue journey through James chapter 1. And uh, both, both sections, I'm, I'm convinced there's a lot for us to learn and I uh, hope it will be a blessing to you. Um, men's prayer Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. Speaking about men's activities on Saturday morning, the, on June 18th, uh, we will be having a men's, uh, men's breakfast and uh, certainly invite all the men to come, encourage people with this uh, uh, fine time of fellowship and, and prayer. And then, of course, Father's Day is coming up on the 19th. And uh, as, as it was right to honor, honor mothers, it's also right to honor fathers. And, uh, and I speak that as a father. <laughs> but amen. It's uh, indeed a divine command that we honor our fathers and our mothers. Amen. And uh, both have a very important part, contribution to our lives. Of course, Vacation Bible School is um, coming up on July 11th through the 15th. And uh, more things that we're working on preparing and uh, start to spread the word and look forward to God doing a great work in the church and uh, outreach to boys and girls. All right. Well, good. Well, there are the announcements. And uh, you know, thanksgiving to the Lord, recognizing his goodness. Um, had someone after after the service you know, tell me how that they uh, understanding the the format of this morning when we gave the opportunity to highlight some of the uh, the uh, couples who have been married for 25 plus years and what a what an honor to have such a such a number of folks that uh, represent long long marriages and, and we certainly honor the Ruffs as an example over 60 62 or was it 63 years of marriage, what, a, what an honor to have them in our presence and fine example they are to all of us. Uh, we had um, uh, more than one family that is over, un, more than one couple over 40 years, I think uh, 45, 42, or 43, and then I had uh, another, uh, Elvira uh, texted us or uh, communicated also during the service, and I understand she was Elvira Maher at 43, 41, 41. So, you know, praise the Lord. Uh, great, great testimonies that um, you know we need to have hold is that uh, you know God does bless with uh, you know long life and marriages together and the benefit thereof. And uh, may we hold it up as good examples to others. Amen. May there be many more that join the ranks of these dear folks and uh, partake of the blessings. Well, the um, oh, what I was saying. A lady, dear lady afterwards shared a blessing to me that the uh, Lord blessed with them being able to get a different vehicle uh, that they were you know uh, more accommodating to their family and uh, so she was praising the Lord for opening the doors with that this morning maybe you have some other prairie like praises tonight anyone have something that they are express a word of Thanksgiving sister of course Amen. Amen. Well, we thank the Lord for sharing sharing His Word, the principles out of His Word, and um, you know there's such a need. You know, uh, mindful that as a child, I, although I was not in Sunday school a lot as a child, but what exposure I did have um, made a difference in my life, and uh, what brief exposure to vacation Bible school account those experiences as being seed planting times that. Uh, help to promote uh, a beginning of my faith and so amen yeah anyone else thanksgivings recognizing God's goodness amen amen one lady one lady that came in to clean uh, after they finished uh, I walked out and she was sitting on it and just like oh, this is really nice just sitting there right in front of the playground and yeah so uh, amen. You know, uh, thank the Lord for the blessings. All right. Any other Thanksgivings? Okay. Well, much to thank the Lord for. All right. Well, at this time, we'll, we'll go ahead and uh, begin our study this evening. 
And um, <clears throat> we're going to be turning to back to the book of Genesis. <clears throat> Genesis I've got my Sunday morning notes in front of me, but let me get my Sunday evening notes. Um, we're begun, we're going to be coming to Genesis chapter 10 this evening, Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, verse 1. Now these are the generations of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And unto them were son born, uh, sons born after the flood. It's Genesis 10, 1. Father in heaven, Lord, I do pray that you bless our study tonight. Lord, teach us. Lord, I pray that the uh, that you'd leave me with give me the ability to teach your word effectively, and to be encouraging and help others with knowing you and and uh, learning your ways. Guide us by your Spirit. Enliven our study. May may be vivid in our understanding. May we grasp the truths of your word. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, as I announced and what's the objective is to kind of give an overview of significant historical events of the Bible and as I mentioned that in times past I did put something up there on the slide just kind of giving some some insight of some events we certainly begin with creation and uh, one of the things as we come along I, I want to try to build a, a timeline and as we talk about significant events Creation, certainly the beginning of, we talk about time, the beginning of time, amen? And, um, and so all things began. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. We have all the origins of things there. As we've come along, we've, we've realized that there are a number of um, uh, events. And matter of fact, I sketched out there at least 19 events on our, our slide. There's a, this is really not an exhaustive study. I'm having to remind myself to be brief. Uh, don't get don't get bogged down too much in the details, which is really hard because I like to teach through the details, and there's so many details for us to learn. But as we continue thinking about major events in the Bible, certainly after creation, a major turn of events after the six week, like six days, seven, the first week of creation, uh, the fall came at some time. We don't know exactly how long after. The scriptures do not detail that, but certainly the fall brought great consequences. Sin entered the world, uh, consequences of hardships and judgments because of that, and ultimately death entered into this world. And that which was so good and, and, and uh, wholesome became corrupted by sin, and we've all been impacted by that. As we all are impacted by the beauty of creation, we're also impacted by the fall, of the sin, the marring. Uh, after the fall, Mankind, if we were to think about population-wise, you, you might think that there was a, a narrow line of family at first that spread into a, a great population. And then if, at the flood, you know, we find that, you know, as we're reading in Genesis, that man looked, uh, God looked down at man, and man's heart was intent, evil, continually, violence filled the earth. God was, was moved to judge the world, and he judged it by the way of the flood. And so that would be a next major event don't know how many people lost their lives in that judgment, but uh, based upon what we could tell in the scripture, certainly the indication, many, many, many people who had uh, fallen under the judgment of God. And uh, what a sad commentary. God, however, there was a man named Noah that found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And out of that, God directed him to build an ark of which he, his wife, his three, three sons and their wives, so eight people, 
were preserved and uh, survived the flood as well as the animals that were on the ark, uh, that preservation of, of life. And, um, and after this population of this world was destroyed in judgment, they came to, again, uh, man began to, uh, they came off the ark and from now the descendants of Abraham, and I mean, pardon me, Noah, which is where we're at here, indicates the, the progression of, again, population starting to expand again, to grow again. You know, hi historically, as we, we look at things and uh, we see the, hmm. ah, okay. I had a uh, map that maybe is on another slide and uh, let me take a moment and grab a flash drive and Fred might be able to get that up. But a map of uh, just the area that really works with expressing the needs, I mean the, the progression. Right, let's just see if that uh, if there might be an additional slide on it. I thought I had that updated it, but it might not have done so. Um, but as we look at it here, let's, let's talk about chapter 10. Chapter 10 certainly would be a progression of the of historical events here as civilization starts to develop again from the sons of, of Abraham. And we have uh, uh, sons of, of Noah, pardon me. <coughs> You know, who was on the ark? Moses, and and uh, you know who received it. You know we get all sorts of things confused very quickly. Okay, we're talking about Noah. We will eventually get to Abram and Abraham, and then ultimately to Moses. But uh, let's keep all things in proper order. All right. So the Bible describes here Noah having three sons: Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and under them were born sons after the flood. And so we find the description here of these, these sons, and we have names that are associated with these, these sons. In verse, uh, chapter, chapter 10, verse 2 and on, you see the first set that are the sons of Japheth. And you see the sons of Japheth, Go, you know, what were their names? Gomer and Magog and Made and Javan and Jubal and Meshach and Tyrus. And, and then you have the names further. Uh, being explained as their children and such. And, and so you have as the verse 5, the end of it says, everyone after his tongue and after their families and their nations. And so we begin a, a progression of the nations that uh, start to come into this picture. And um, if you look at this, you, this is kind of a, a map of the, the Middle East that will provide several key things. We're talking about key places in Genesis. Uh, the ark came to rest in the mountains of Ararat, you know, generally understood to be up here. Uh, I guess what we would be talking about today of, um, of east of, of modern-day Turkey uh, and the area of what's that, Armenia, is that what the, the name of the modern country? The north of Ir Iraq and Iran and uh, mountains of, of Ariad. I think actually that Mount Ariad is in, in Turkey um, geographically today. But um, if you think about that being where the, the ark settled and you have the nation start to spread out from that, of course we're gonna find one particular thing expressed in the next chapter. If we see here the descendants being expressed in chapter 10, but before they start to spread out, there's a, another particular event, the Tower of Babel which is generally thought to be down here in Mesopotamia. So you can see the descendants came down out of the mountains into the, this fertile valley, and uh, the major city of Babel, uh, the town, town and the area there being developed and the progression that happens from there. But let, let's just uh, make a few references about these, these sons. Uh, there's Japheth, and then there's Ham, and verse 6. Um, let me, let me make a reference about Japheth. It is generally thought that the nations that come from Japheth are nations that end up settling in basically Eurasia. 
So from the north of the, you see the, the Caspian Sea there, and then the area here, kind of up in this area, and then all the way across to, to Spain, which is not on the map. That's usually the people that are considered coming from Japheth's descendants. Now, there are some mixing of the nations and places, so we're speaking about very general terms. Um, you have the next descendants, which would be the descendants of Ham in verse 6. And the sons of Ham, you have the names Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. And then you have that further broken down there. And uh, one of the notable examples, the name mentioned, is in verse 8, And Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one in the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, even as Nimrod, the, uh, the mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And then you have some other names that are associated there. Um, out of the land went forth Asher and built Nineveh. Now, these are names that start to come out of, refer to Ham's descendants. And the initial number that are mentioned are generally thought to uh, be ones who go to Africa. Of course, Cana, Canaan, which would be over here, the land of Canaan, which we will be talking about a lot. Uh, descendants of Ham. The area of Mizraim is an old name that is often associated with Egypt. And uh, then you find the other ones there, Put and uh, Cush. And I think Put is what we think of Libya, kind of spreading across the north coast of Africa. And uh, so generally thinking is that people of Africa come from the descendants of, of Ham. Again, general speaking, the, the last one is the sons of Shem. And um, you find Shem and his descendants start reference in verse 21. And unto Shem, unto also the father of the children of Eber, the brother of Japheth, the elder even to him were children born. The children of Shem, Elam, and Asher, and Arphaxed, and Lud, and Aram. And the children of Aram, and you find names that are going down here. And these are what we take, and if you, get the, if you hear the term Semitic, Understand that Semitic comes from Shem. It's, uh, and so the Semitic people, oftentimes we come to focus particularly about uh, Semitic people, particularly about the children of Israel. And when we think about anti-Semitic, it's speaking about attacks against the children of Israel. Uh, the, the term earlier was the, you know, in Israel, Abraham and his descendants would be of the sons of Shem. Uh, but you see some other ones there uh, noted. And, and there's a lot of discussion. We could really, you know, you could spend hours in this chapter. Again, we're just doing an over, overview of things. But you see some, some names that will show up. Uh, Elam, Asher. Asher would be what Assyria, if I recall correctly, comes, comes from. Nation of Assyria. You come down a little further, you see Aram. Aram, if you ever heard of Aramaic or Aramaic. Um, Aram is also... Uh, I think it's an old name for what uh, would we, we would come to refer to as Syria, uh, the people that were in, in that area. So you, you have descendants that are mixed in there from, you know, across the Middle East and then heading eastward, and uh, generally the pattern of where the origins of the nations come from, from these three people, um, their descendants. Of course, there's a lot of history that starts to unfold here, and one of the particular aspects in the big, big event that happens next is in verse 11, on chapter 11. Chapter 11. And if we were put down the historical pattern of things, we'd have to refer to after the flood a major event that, that uh, turning point of history is the Tower of Babel. You know, when we read that, let's read the chapter 11, some of the verses of chapter 11. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, Go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone, and slime had they for mortar. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city 
and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, and they may not, that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. From thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, there are several things I think we can draw from observations, very significant observations. You know, what was going on here? Well, it, apparently the people and the descendants initially coming down off the, uh, the, the family started to grow. They they migrated down and, and started settling together rather than as what God directed them to go forth and replenish the earth to populate the earth, spread out. But that didn't occur. Instead, they, they took and said, well, if we do that, then you know, we'll lose our name. You know, there's, there's a danger of us uh, losing our place in a sense. And you, you see how they, they took and... and uh, Made a, made a decision to rally, to stay together and to build something. As they said, go out, uh, um, <clears throat> in verse 4, and they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach into heaven. Let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the old earth, whole earth. Well, many understand that this was an act of rebellion against God. You can see a sense of self-focus, focusing upon man and his accomplishments, his plans and purposes, rather than fulfilling God's plan and, and organizing against God's directive, uh, ignoring God's directive. I think these are some things we can take from this passage. Some inter interesting things here. We, we see that there was a uh, sense of everyone being of, of one language, one speech. Uh, everyone was able to communicate and uh, easily and so that led to a unity in this, this group. We see further that they build a city. And uh, cities are kind of interesting in the Bible. And cities are still interesting today as uh, where people gather together. And uh, oftentimes um, cities sometimes are not the most health, health, morally healthy places. Uh, and certainly this seemed to be built as a sense of rebellion against God, opposition to his will. And then additionally, they build something. Not only build a city, but they build a tower whose top may reach into, into heaven. Now, there's a discussion there about what that might, might mean. Um, but you see here something, the motive of the city, building the city and the tower is, uh, is a thought that, and let us make a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Let us come together, build our, our name in this process. Now, talking about this tower, uh, there's discussions about what this tower might have been, what its purpose, you know, significance of it. Historically, archaeological-wise, uh, there's a lot of digs that have uncovered what are referred to as ziggurats, uh, a basically man-made hills in the, the Middle East. And uh, these ziggurats were, were uh, built, you know, as, uh, as high points in the plains and such. And there on the top of those ziggurats often were places of worship. Uh, there were some probably were dedicated to worshiping the, the stars or the uh, maybe even some of it worshiping, uh, turning what was a natural observations into places of worship. You know, you have some of that where the zodiac coming from a map of the stars to that of being predictive of the future or somebody's what zodiac sign that they are born, born under. Uh, you could see that that was very strong in the culture of that day. 
the ziggurats also were places of exaltation. I was one of the study Bibles I had. Um, there's some discussion about whether this tower, the Tower of Babel, was actually a massive ziggurat or some type of thing. We have simply the description here that they describe whose top may reach into heaven, unto heaven, you know, which would lead us to think it, it obviously has some type of religious connotation to it. Is it, uh, are they trying to build a, uh, since works-based way of entering the heaven? Um, Another study Bible they had was interesting that they noted archaeological wise that this was an interesting a common name that were a number of ziggurats. Matter of fact, there were four ziggurats that were named, locations in that area that uh, the study Bible mentioned. The names of, of one, I, let me read some of these names. Uh, one in the, the city of uh, uh, Larso, I think, was the name of it, was named the, the House of the Link Between Heaven and Earth. The house of the link between heaven and earth. Another one, and um, I can't read the, the name that I wrote for the city, but I was copying, hand copying it. But the name of the, the ziggurat was the house of the seven guides of heaven and earth. You can see a, a common theme that is developing here. Uh, in Babylon, there was a ziggurat that was found there and uh, researched and covered, established the name that they were calling. It was the house of the foundation platform of heaven and earth. You can see the continuing pattern. And the last one found in Asher uh, was a ziggurat that was referred to as the house of the mountain of the universe. You see they, they gave these rather you know, high expectations of these, these places, these constructions of men to be a high tower. And you can Certainly think about it in the place where if this was in a plain, a wide open flat space, and you have this, this high man-made hill with this, uh, how much more, it was a sense of a beacon, a rallying point that could be seen and, and people came together. Well, we don't know how exactly, how, how tall they got, and there's very little details other than the statement that's written here, but it seems like that um, very clearly this was at the root of it, rebellious towards God. Um, and you see that God responds. The Lord came down to see the city in chapter 11, verse 5, and the tower which the children of men builded. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they began to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Hmm. It's kind of a, really a sad commentary. It, the, the more... Mankind get, gets organized on a massive scale. It would seem the tendency is always for it to end up being rebellion against God. Um, the bigger things become. You know, I think that's a pattern still existing today. Uh, large cities are notorious for being places that are not necessarily given to honoring the Lord. <laughs> and um, oftentimes, you know, Larger governments come, become and such like that, the bigger their ego become too. They're the source of everybody's dependence. And, and rather than focusing on God, God saw this and he intervened. And what he did was to cause them to scatter, was to introduce this concept of languages. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. And this is what brought it to an end, of where the Lord confounded their language. In verse 9, therefore it is the name of it called Babel, because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, I will freely admit, I have only grown up reading, speaking one language, and after many years of diligent work of teachers and uh, schooling trying to teach me English, I don't know if I really do them justice to all their hard labors because I still mess up our, our language. But it's the language I speak. I've tried to learn some other languages. I can't say that I'm proficient in any other language. I only have a taste, a little bit of... of, uh, of info, understanding, but um, personally, 
I have found that languages are quite a challenge. They are a natural barrier. Uh, they does seem to take and divide people. It still divides people. You know, we, we take, and of all the things, we may talk about cultural or ethnic differences and distinctives. Um, it would seem that one of the most, the strongest aspects of cultural distinctive, distinctiveness is languages, the language. Um, and that's the hardest part to come overcome. We overcome food. <laughs> you know, in America, we have quite a number of food, with Italian food, Mexican food, Chinese food. I mean, we just freely go, you don't have to, you know, you speak English, you can go to any of them, right? And it's, uh, you know, even if somebody's sitting at the next table, you know, speaking another language, but we got the same food, we're enjoying it, you know, we can cross over that barrier. Um, but languages, languages are, are challenging. And throughout the history of man has been one of those things that divides and yet also unites. Um, you know, I think that that uh, speaks about the nature of a way a country comes together is a common language. It's one of those, those things that, that pulls people of all different backgrounds into a common, common uh, government, a common country, is uh, languages, challenges that are therein. You know, it's interesting, and as a matter of fact, I don't know if anyone else has some insight. I'm sure there's many could speak about some of the things about language, observations about languages. Um, you know, we, we have to remember as far as languages goes, the, the story doesn't end in chapter 11 uh, of Genesis. Chapter 11 of Genesis speaks about the dividing and people scattering and, and then you know, pulling in groups because of the languages that they would speak together, the common, common languages. And of course, they spread out across the face of the world. And indeed, you know, in the course of history, there is a, you know, in the face of even mankind today, there are a lot of major languages and then many sub-languages, um, pocket languages even, and places all over this world. When we come to the New Testament, and I won't turn there at this point, but you know enough of it. You remember in Acts chapter 2, you remember as uh, Christ gave the command to the church to go forth and preach the gospel to every creature. and. In the beginning of the church, the initiation of the church, it was the matter of the gift of tongues, which when you examine it was the gift of languages, and where all men heard their, the gospel spoken in their own language. And it's unique that in that, that Holy Spirit working, God overcame what was one of the chief dividing things of mankind and in introducing something that becomes the great unifier where we all can come together at, in Christ, in the church. You know, and, and where we live at today, we, we live in a mixture of, of that, that day and time, don't we? Um, you know, the reality is there are different cultures, different languages. We struggle across those barriers. But then there's also something wonderful about the uniqueness of the body of Christ, which does something this world cannot do crossing barriers and cultures and even languages. And the Spirit of Christ, we come together as one people, believing in the Lord, the creator of all, the Lord who is our Savior, bought by the same blood, bought by the same, you know, work of Christ, redeemed. <laughs> you know, I've had the blessing of being in some other countries and, uh, and, and visiting with churches that are on foreign territory, if you want to say other countries, and either other languages, and um, always find it a blessing that when you gather together in the house of the Lord among the people who name the name of Christ, even though you might not be able to, you know, understand all of what's being said, you get a sense of the, the closeness, the kinship, the specialness that is there, the uniqueness of Christ. Hmm. Well, indeed, you know, the world we seek to bring man, mankind together under one umbrella, but ultimately ends up to be rebellion. But, but what God will ultimately accomplish in his one kingdom under one king, the Lord Jesus Christ, is where true unity, not rebellion, but harmony under the kingdom of the Lord will come. We set forth here, we see the, the struggles of this world. We see the Tower of Babel, of course, mankind starts to spread out and 
And from here you start seeing the, the next chapter. We'll deal with the table of the nations as they start to spread out and further development, history unfolding of the nations beginning to form and the people, the beginnings of those groups that will form all, nations all over the world. And then we find chapter 12. And chapter 12 really is a, a key turning point in the, the progression of history. For this is where God comes from focusing on all the peoples of the world to name a particular man. Focus on a man named Abram. Which ultimately will focus on a family that comes from Abram of all the nations of this world. This is a key, key turning point in history. And uh, as we look at this, we examine chapter 11. Look at the end of chapter 11, verses 27 through 32. Genesis 11, 27 through 32. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran begot Lot. And Haran be died before his, his father, Terah, in the land of his nativity, and Ur of the Chaldees. And Abram and Nahor took their wives. The name of Abram's was, wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, and the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iskar. But Sarai was bera, barren, and she had no child and Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his son's son, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abraham's wife. And they went forth with them from Ur of the Chaldees to go into the land of Canaan. And they came unto Haran and dwelt there. And the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Well, we see here a progression. You see down here on this map, here's Ur of the Chaldees in the Mesopotamian area, this fertile area. You find here, here's Haran, or Haran, um, <clears throat> the, it's up here. And that's where Terah went, and that's where Terah died. And then from there, the journey of Abraham and Lot and Sarai continued on to the land of, of Canaan here. You see this big arc, and that kind of gives us a, the, the fertile crescent that uh, is a path of, of life along that area. It's north of a desert area and uh, becomes a path of civilization develops and the path of the journey of many a nation and the unfolding history. And also in this picture you find that uh, as you get that in your mind that this is the kind of the path of travel up here and then down this way, you find out that the land of Canaan ends up to be a kind of a, a constricted point of travel from this area down into Egypt. And of course, Egypt being another major power at that time. And Egypt going in order to go up this way, you know, would go through the land of Canaan. So there's a lot of history that unfolds as not only relating to the land they came from, but the land that is to the south of them, Egypt. And right in the middle is the land of Canaan, where Abraham will come to. As we come to chapter 12, chapter 12 certainly is the key with, with introducing us more about Abram and setting something that, again, I think are statements, promises that are made to, to Abram that, that still impact us today, uh, form the, the path of history. In chapter 12, it says, Now the Lord God said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that cursed thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That's a unique statement, a very important statement. And um, as you look at this and you understand where this is and the placement of history, you, you realize that from Abram will, will come a, a nation that we will call Israel. Not only will the nation of Israel come, but uh, Ishmael's descendants too. Well, it's another story. Next, uh, we'll get to that briefly. But uh, 
But of Israel, ultimately, there would come one who would be a blessing to, to all the nations of the world, our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. But you see also that God has chosen this man out of all the people. Uh, certainly God was working the lives of other people, but the biblical account focuses on Abram. And Abram will be pulled out and singled out to be a lesson to us all. It will be a work that will be done that ultimately will be the word of God presented to us, the, the promises, the plans, the understanding of, of God revealing himself to mankind, and then ultimately Jesus Christ, our, our Savior. In a way, it genealogical-wise begins here in great earnestness with Abram when the focus becomes on this man and his family. Certainly there are statements here that we have to take note of. We just, it just begs to, in a sense, it's, it's a shining light saying these are statements that are, that are defining. I will make of thee a great nation. It's going to come a, a great nation of him. I will bless thee and make thy name great. The name of Abram, and later on his name will be changed to Abraham, is one of the most respected names of, of uh, mankind. Not only from the Israelites, but from the, those who would be the Arabs, or uh, even among those that are Muslims, uh, to that of Christians. Uh, millions and millions and millions of people will look to Father Abraham, in a sense. Uh, probably would have been good if I would have picked up a copy of it, but I remember a number a couple of years back, National Geographic uh, did a, a, a book, one of their publications, one of their National Geographic dedicated to Abraham, the sons of Abraham. I think it's been about 10 years ago or so, but uh, rather interesting read, looking at, uh, from, from their point of view, I mean, just looking at Geographic, National Geographic taking and observing that it's hard, you, you can't not deny this, how many people, millions and millions of people in this world look back to this man named Abraham. Well, why? Genesis chapter 12 gives us some beginnings, some insight. God said, I will bless them that bless thee, curse him that curseth thee, and thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And there's a lot to be said of that statement. What, you know, what, there's, there's something, um, you know, do we speak highly of Abraham or do we speak badly of him? Do we curse him? You might find there that uh, there's the roots of both that, which speaks about um, the blessedness of the, you know, all of us by, by faith ultimately being a child of Abraham and blessing him, but also those that would be some of the roots of where the persecution of so much for the years of what we refer to as anti-Semitism, the cursing of Abraham's descendants, and uh, particularly the line of, of Israel. Well, there's a lot being said there. Again, uh, we remind myself that brief, brief survey. But moving right along, um, we see in the next verses, verses 4 through 9, Another significant thing. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him. And Lot went with him. And Abraham was 70 and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai, uh, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Verse 6, And Abram passed through the land into the place of Sechem, unto the plain of Marai, Marai. And the Canaanite was then in the land. The Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thee, unto thy seed, will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. Well, here we have a statement that where God is making a promise to Abram that this land, even though it's occupied by another people, the Canaanites, I'm going to give you this land. And so the promises of God, that God will make of him a great nation, he will bless those that bless, curse those that curse, and now we have a statement, I'm going to give you this land that you're here. And certainly to this day, this is still a point that is a focus of, of history. Um, 
these events and uh, the struggles of the world against the plans of God and all the things involved. There's a lot that can be said of this. Well, as we continue further, we see other events, and we'll skip over a couple of chapters here, but let's go to chapter 15. Chapter 15, again focusing on this man Abram. And after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. There's some beautiful statements here, statements that uh, we certainly would echo in faith in the Lord. In verse 2, And Abram said, Lord God, what wilt thou give me, saying, I go childless, and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold to me, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir, but he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad and said, Look now toward heaven. And tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shalt thy seed be. I wonder what that would have been like. I wonder because uh, I guess I've dwelled in a city area with a lot of lights. <laughs> but you can imagine in that day and time, open country area, no light pollution, God having Abraham find Abram there and drawing his attention to the, all the stars of heaven, which just probably was just overwhelming. You know, when you get a chance to be in an area where there's good stargazing area, uh, you get a sense of how much we, we miss in the city. But all the stars. And as Abram's eyes were lifted up and God speaking to his heart, taking in the beauty of the of the moment and all the wonder of it. God spoke to him and said, Look now toward heaven, tell the stars, if thou be able to number them. And he said unto him, So shall thy seed be. You know, God had made a promise to him before, had spoken. Now he speaks to him with such specificness and such force in the moment that his words to him, that's promise, birthed something and Abram received a response. In verse 6, and he believed in the Lord and he counted it to him for righteousness. What is that saying? Abraham heard the promise of God and received it. He believed God. Now there's a lot in that statement a lot of what that means, but, but the essence of where he heard the promise of God and he had faith. He believed. He believed in the Lord and he counted to him, God counted it to him, Abraham, for righteousness. Now, if you remember our study in Romans, you will find that Paul will draw from this this point and develop it into a very important doctrinal illustration of that we are justified by faith. In essence, the illustration of what's being said here defines so clearly the way of our salvation involves God's work on our behalf, God's great promises that are beyond our ability. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot, you know, we, we can in and of ourselves warrant the attention of God, but God and His grace, His mercy, His love for us sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins. And as He speaks to our hearts the promise of Him, His promise is saying, if you believe on my Son, your sins will be forgiven. You'll become my child. Christ died for your sins. It is enough to forgive you, justify you. And as we respond like Abraham of old, who heard the promise of God and said, Lord, I believe, a wonderful transaction occurs. 
salvation. Oh, what a defining moment in the history of man recorded here in these statements. As God reached down, spoke his promises, and Abram believed. In verse 7, God continues on. He said unto him, I am the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees to give thee this land to inherit. And he said, Lord God, whereby shall I know that I shall inherit it? And he said unto him, Take me a heifer of three years old, and a she-goat of three years old, and a ram of three years old, and a turtle dove, and young pigeon. He took unto him all those, and divided them in the midst, and laid each piece one another against another, but the birds divided he not. And when the fowls came down upon the carcasses, Abram drove, Abram drove them away. And when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and lo, a horror of great darkness fell upon him, and he and he said unto Abram, speaking about God, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom thou shalt serve will I judge, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp passed between those pieces. And the same day the Lord God made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto, thee, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenites, the Kizanites, and the Kedemites, the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Rephiums, and the Amorites, and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Now there's a lot being said there, but what's going on here is an interesting picture of where he takes these animals, he's directed to take these animals and basically cut them in half, lay them on one side or the other. Um, Abraham's doing his best to keep the the, the vultures away. <laughs> and, uh, but in the midst of it, he falls asleep. While he's asleep, God comes down. And we have the picture of a, a smoking, uh, let's see, where is it? It's, I think where it says, um, um, verse 17, it came to pass that when the sun went down, it was a dark, dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces which evidently indicate the presence of God walking between those pieces. Now, what's going on here? You see the next word speaks about a covenant. There's a, there's a covenant being made. God making covenant, verse 18, in the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram. What in the, if I understand in that culture in that day and time when, when a treaty, an agreement was made, one of the sacred ways of doing it was that they would split animals like this, lay them side, you know, one side counted the other. Then the two individuals that were agreeing upon this would walk together through these split animals, consecrating their covenant, their commitment to one another. But what we find here uniquely so is that the two did not walk through. Abram fell asleep. That God came down and walked through it. Many have interpreted and understood that what is being said here is this is an unconditional covenant. It's not dependent upon Abram, it's dependent upon God. God is the one who will see this come to pass. He sets a promise, He will perform this. What a defining statement as we are introduced to God being the one who carries and fulfills the covenants. You know, same thing when it comes to the new covenant, <laughs> the matter of our salvation. All the pieces were put together by what our Lord Jesus Christ did. What are we to do? Simply receive by faith, enter into the promises, the blessings of what God has for us. There's some other interesting things that unfold here that, that kind of unfold a, the, the next passage of history for Abraham. What's before for his family? 
You see there's the speaking of that verse, verse 12 where a horror of great darkness fell upon him. And the Lord says to him, Know ye of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, and serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. What does this speak about? This is speaking about the Egyptian captivity. Even though that darkness come upon him, look how God gives hope. And also that nation whom thou shalt serve will I judge. Do you hear the exodus there? Are, are the judgments leading up to the exodus? And afterward shall they come out with great substance. There is the exodus, the deliverance. And then you see them also coming to the promised land. And um, verse 16, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, shall come to pass. And there you have the description of this. There's evidence here that ultimately when they come to the promised land, in the days of Joshua, the conquest also seems to be indicated by this passage is a judgment upon the Canaanites for their wickedness. But all of it ultimately in the plan of where God spoke to Abraham, I'm going to give this land to your people. I, I, I'm going to see that you have a people. You're going to have a nation. And your, your nation's going to have a land. And your heritage is going to go on. And great things are going to be happening. Well, we need to come to a close there. But can you see how this starts to set us in motion of so much more of the biblical history that uh, see key events that start to unfold and uh, the days before us here. It's key for us to understand these things because these principles go all the way into the New Testament and all the way to where we're at today and yet into the future. God makes his promises and God will keep his promises. Of that we can be confident. And of that we can trust in him to save us. Amen. Well, let's uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, I pray that I've spoken words that are rightly representing your word and helping people to be inspired in their faith and understanding of your great plan unfolding. Lord, may we see the, the big picture as we journey through these passages. May we see the way your, your word is set up and designed, the great messages. And Lord, hear this glimpse of this great promise that you are a God who, who makes promises. The people who hear and believe, their lives are changed. You have much before us. We thank you for the promise of salvation. We thank you for justification by faith. We thank you for the work of Christ. We thank you for the covenants, particularly the new covenant, by which we stand in relationship with you. Bless your people. Teach us your ways in Jesus' name.